Nicholas Blakeney. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Walker. I come from the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, EPFL, which is where we run the Human Brain Project. I'm a sort of multidisciplinary scientist covering a range from neuroscience to social science, so I'm very intermediate. I know a, a lot of things, a little about each one. I'm going to show some of it today. And the theme for this course is how are humans different from other animals? And uh, where most of you are neuroscientists of some kind, what has this got to do with the brain? And I think all or nearly all cousins, nearly all people think that humans are special primarily because in some way we have special brains. There is some truth to that, but it, I'm going to argue in these lectures, but it's not true in the sort of very obvious and simplistic ways. It's true in rather <coughs> uh, different ways. Uh, so I want to do a little experiment. Now suppose, just imagine for a second that you, something's gone wrong with your lives and you've become geneticists. And you have to write a paper. And in the paper you're reporting the discovery of some gene. <coughs> <coughs> I don't know, a gene for autism, a gene for long legs, a gene for something. What would you actually, I give you two texts which you could say. You could say, uh, the XY gene, the gene so-and-so is expressed in humans and many animals. Or you could write, the XYZ gene is expressed in humans and many other animals. Now just gut instinct, without thinking too much, which would you actually write? Who would write in many animals? One, two, a half. And, and, and is this because, I, and how, three. And who would write in many other animals? We've got real biologists here. Okay. So, if I actually look at Google, if I look at, just in the Google uh, main search, that's the second line we say here, we find 99.4% of references would say humans and other animals, and 0.6% would say humans and any other animals. So, in the general population, this sort of idea that we talk about humans as just being another animal is not really popular. If we go to Google Scholar where we only see academic papers, it improves a bit. We have, or gets worse, it depends on your point of view. About 90% of papers talk about humans and animals, and about 10% talk about humans and any other animals. So I would argue but just in terms of our inbuilt prejudices, that doesn't mean they're true. Most people are what I would call exceptionalists, which forces me to define my term. I looked at the Oxford English Dictionary uh, to see what is the sense of exceptionalism. And the word exceptionalism was first used in the 19th century. And it wasn't used about anything to do with biology at all. It was used to refer to the United States of America. And people who believed in American exceptionalism believed that the United States of America was something special and different from all other countries, whereas other countries had sort of kings and uh, were corrupt and had no sense of adventure and various other failings the United States of America was built under God, one nation under God. It had a perfect democracy. It was large, powerful, and we should all follow it. This was the exceptionalist position. Now, when I talk about 
human exceptionalists, I mean something rather similar. For me, the exceptionalist position, which the way I'm talking about it, you might guess I don't like it very much, the exceptionalist position is that humans really are very special. Uh, we are not subject to the same laws of biology applying to other animals or other organisms. God made us differently. Or maybe some, you don't have to believe in God, there's many non-believers who also think that humans are very special. The anti-exceptionalist position says no. Humans are organisms, they're animals, just like other organisms and just like other animals. We follow the same rules and sure, we are, of course, a bit different, but, but then animals are usually different. Even different breeds of dog are different. So the fact we're just a bit different doesn't have uh, this huge significance. So let's look at it another way. Any species, as we all know as biologists, any species I in biology is unique. Otherwise, we don't call it a species. We don't call two breeds of dog a species. They can, they can interbreed and they can produce other dogs. But a cockroach is an absolutely unique biological organism. So just saying that humans are unique is not saying anything particularly special. We'd have to say that you humans are unique in some special way which makes them different from the uniqueness you get with any biological species. So, for instance, if we have some metric for measuring the difference between species, the difference between humans and, let's say, other apes should be bigger than the difference between, let's say, dogs and other canines, or between domestic cats and other felines. And of course, this is a, a very questionable thing. It's not at all certain that this is true. Obviously, we have quantitative differences. We can be bigger, smaller, have bigger brains, smaller brains. But are we qualitatively different? Is there a, just a sharp cutoff which cuts us off from other animals? So, if we look at the actual biology, you will find, for instance, that in human genetics, we're not very different from a chimpanzee. There's different ways of measuring it, but maybe there's 5% of sequence difference between the two. There are virtually no novel human genes. There's one study I'm going to be looking at in much greater detail later in this course, where they think that the study claims that the number, there's only been time for maybe five or six major genetic changes since humans split off <laughs> from the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees. We go up a level. We look at the brain. There is no type of cell which you can find in the human brain which you can't find in a chimpanzee brain and probably not much which you can't find in other mammalian brains. You look at the you look at the brain as a whole, uh, the human brain is bigger. It's bigger particularly in cell numbers. Again, in my fourth lecture, I'm going to look at the actual anatomy of the brain. We have probably three times as many neurons in the human brain as a chimpanzee. On the other hand, we have only a third of the number of neurons as an elephant. So this also uh, doesn't really help us very much. We look at the ratios between neurons and glial cells, in humans, it's one to one. Chimpanzees, too. So where are the big differences? They don't seem to be biological. Now, I'm going to be arguing that the big differences, what really makes humans special, is not biological at all. It's cultural. The fact I'm talking to you here makes me distinct and makes us <coughs> distinct from any other species. To our knowledge, there are no chimpanzee professors teaching classes of young chimpanzees wanting to become wise. And I'm going to also argue that this is true, not necessarily, and not in the first instance, to our special brain, but that it's true to unique factors in human.
seems so conceptualized. Therefore, it doesn't necessarily have to be to do with the wonderful properties of human cognition. That's the hypothesis I'm going to put this in. Because you don't, I don't expect you to believe me like that. I know you have to work it through. So the question is, I'm going to ask you not just that. I'm also going to ask why, if our logical intelligence is so important, why shouldn't other animals also develop the same ability? Our the basic building plan of our brain and our basic network is very, very similar to what of chimpanzees, and we draw the same thing. So why do we, if it was so useful to be clever, why didn't they evolve to clever too? And obviously they didn't. And again, I'm going to say I'm going to get them to do with our heads. Now this whole lecture talk is going to be organized around four basic hypotheses, which I'll go through now quickly, but then we'll go through them much more slowly during the talk. So the first hypothesis is this. The proximate cause of human process and activity and differentiation is cumulative social egoism. In normal conditions, human processes innovate faster than the innovations that come off them. I'll just define some terms. What do I mean by proximate? If I look at causation, I have um, the causes in the near past. So, for instance, I can say that this person is unhappy because his girlfriend doesn't get on with him. That is a proximate cause. I can look backwards a little bit and I say she doesn't get on with him because they have two completely different family backgrounds and we don't know. This is a slightly more distant cause. I can go back to that and look at the deep historical reasons why if she comes from Holland and he comes from Japan, those are going to make them two really different cultures. And I can go even further back and look why Japanese culture came that way and why Dutch culture came this way. So all, I'm not telling here of the deep, long distance cause of human difference in culture, but the immediate cause. What came first? Now I say here, that we have cumulative cultural evolution. I'll define that now in a second. What I mean is our culture evolves and becomes richer over time. If I look at technology, the technology that we were using two or three hundred years ago were much simpler than the technologies we use today. And we, if whatever time period I look at, I can see that human culture evolves over time. This is cumulative evolution. I use what I learn and drawn earlier in history as a building block for building other things which I can use in a later period of history. So I develop a wheel, and the wheel becomes a building block for parts, and the basic architecture of the part becomes a building block for the architecture of a car, and so on and so forth. This is if I see, if I look at the tools that chimpanzees use, and in the entomology lecture we'll look at tools, we find that the tools they use today are almost identical to the tools they were using 100 years ago. They don't have this cumulative evolution. Why does this happen? Uh, many animals do know that they can find new solutions to old problems. But innovations usually over time become obsolete. They become obsolete. Uh, largely because the world changed. You know, I, I, we all know the, the idea of antibiotic resistance. You get an antibiotic, it works very well against infection. It lasts for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. After which, most of the bacteria that also evolved to become resistant to the antibiotic doesn't work anymore. The same applies to human innovations. You learn to do something, but after a while, it's a weapon. Your, your, your prey learns to obey this. It's a weapon. Your enemy learns to fight it back. Whatever, it doesn't always last forever. What I'm going to be arguing in cumulative evolution is that humans, and only humans, 
So about every three years, they do a test for telephone. They take a look at people and risk their fitness and test the things they have. So that is going to be the next generation of tests. And who was telling? Because in the United States, people are getting regular number of tests. Fairly well done. Took them hundreds and hundreds of millions. And if you compare 1970 to 1920, you're about 270 years into the world. It's an enormous improvement. Uh, and the further analysis, uh, most of the time the tests do several different scales of this. There's a verbal intelligence based on sources and so forth. Only one scale improves. It's a thing called the rate of matrices, which is a thing about logical reasoning. The logical reasoning scale has improved enormously. And the other scales are flat. They just stay the same. Uh, later work by other psychologists has replicated this throughout the Western world and much of the non-Western world where people are exposed to modern tests. So something, and the result is very, very solid, something over the last 60 years has caused people to suddenly do fairly well on abstract logical reasoning tests. And I think we all know this can't possibly be a biological thing. It's something in our culture. The biological thing just doesn't work that way. It must be too many people simultaneously. So something in our modern culture has made us good at that sort of thing. I will take that. That doesn't prove my point. None of what I'm saying today proves my hypothesis as true. It's just evidence that they're not completely incredible. I'll come to real proof only in my last lecture of course. But everything else is going to be evidence of plausibility. So, what I'm arguing in my second hypothesis is that living in a cultural world, and we all live in a cultural world, changes the nature of the brain. It makes it better at doing cultural things. And this feeds back in a positive feedback loop. So I guess I started from that helps me to build more cults. It's like reading into the classroom back. So I get more and more cults. So that is my second hypothesis. Hypothesis <coughs> number three. Humans, because we have a culture, have created what I call, and other people have called, a cultural niche. Our psychological niche is a niche where people have faith. Uh, by culture, I don't just mean the opera. I don't mean the great works of religion. I don't mean poetry. I mean the fact that we learn behaviors and skills, or we see it from our fellow people. The fact that we jointly create technology, that to me is faith. So I'm, when I, every time I talk about culture, I'm not talking about shy culture. Uh, for me, as someone in a tribe of hunter-gatherers in Africa, is just as cultured as I am. We both have a culture, we have different cultures. So in that sense, all human beings, or nearly all human beings, live in a cultural niche. Now, in straight <coughs> forward Darwinian evolution, we know that organisms and animals adapt We're not necessarily cultural because we have some special thing in our brain. But once we have those, there's a reason for me coming to this in my hypothesis number four. Uh, once we have culture, that creates a measure of selection and preference. That's the reason why we hunt. Because we have some language. And we use the language to communicate in useful information to each other. Then the individual human, for better at using language, better at learning language, better at transmitting it to their offspring, selective advantage in normal Darwinian terms. This is no longer cultural selection. This is straightforward natural selection. And just like our improvements in our plastic brain help us with these patterns, the feedback from the universal niche actually makes our brains physically better. So again, we have a positive feedback loop. And I come to my all of them, I think. It's the one which I speak least of today. Most of my own research is on this. Um, is that this depends pretty, well, you can't really, as I say, you can't really use this in a lot of things, but anyway, 
Now go to this video called The Slide on the website. You can download them, but they also they have lectures, they have everything. So the idea is that what we are teaching Edward is not so much our social drama, but it's our pattern of social relationship. Briefly, if you go to chimpanzees, you can have two chimpanzees on different sides of the mountain range or different sides of the river, and they will never communicate with each other for thousands and thousands of years. And you'll find that you can actually see that in their genetics. Two chimpanzee populations a few tens of kilometers apart have more genetic diversity than do humans over the whole globe. Those, those chimpanzees 200 kilometers apart are more different than Australian Aborigines and me, which means they're never, never in contact. That means actually that at one chimpanzee in population one, you invent something. Population two never gets to know about it. This is not true in any human population at any time of history. We've always been connected. So I'm going to produce evidence for this later on. But we have small social groups, typically in a hunter-gatherer society of 100 people, 150 people. But always they have links to neighboring groups. And those neighboring groups have long distances. And they have long distances going back tens of thousands of years. We just, we got a paper out just a month ago showing long distances between islands in the South Pacific and South America. There's the Indian Peninsula in, uh, in Easter Island, about 20 kilometers between them, are native South Americans. Probably because they were displaced by them. So we, humans, for a very, very long time, have long distances long distance links, which means they're expo exposed to places which they're not aware of. Not necessarily the huge spreads, but some small ones. And you learn from that. And I'm going to show models later on, show, suggesting how this can trigger and shift cumulative social evolution. So, uh, this is what I'm working on. So far, I've not given you any evidence and I think if you study human evolution, there's a huge amount of convergence. There's lots of people who have nice ideas, some of them very cool, some may even be true, but they suffer from a dramatic lack of evidence, a huge atypical. So later in the lectures, I'm going to try and I'm picking the last lecture. I'm going to show how with complete evidence, I hope to be able to show that these things actually are true, or at least to make it reasonably credible. In the meantime, in the other lectures, I'm going to look at plausibility. We're going to find lots of evidence suggestions that they may be true. Uh, and this is actually evidence, the evidence I use to construct some of my hypotheses for the future now, before I get in to any idea of truth. Um, it's, it's work, my own work is working in the very, very early stages. I'm really interested in hearing from other people who can point out holes in my arguments, that's great can point me to evidence I don't know about, both in favor of what I say or against what I say. That's also great. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, I can't be saying what I'm seeing is unpleasant. This is not really a lot to do with what the Human Brain Project does, so I'm going to mention it at the end. But the Human Brain Project, its main contribution to this research is it's given us funding, it's given me time to think and to work. So I thank them for that. Any matter is going to say it is my responsibility, and not theirs. So, how's this, how's this course going to be for you? Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you. I hope the biologists will be patient with me. I'm going to be talking largely about ideas from philosophy and from basic biology. So this is the one part, there's only one lecture out of six, which is not really biological in any way, except the mentions of Darwin. So I'm going to be talking about Descartes, who was the great European rationalist philosopher, uh, and Darwin, who's my personal favorite. Uh, so this is just a little bit of that. So then we're going to start looking at what, before we, go in, before we start looking at the causes of human differences, we have to look more closely at what happens with them. So I'm going to start off by looking at Homo sapiensis. It used to be framed very often that humans are the only animals on the sea, which is rubbishly false. Uh, I, this is absolutely unaccountable. 
other than the two next to it. So maybe two is less than the fifteen hundred. And I'm interested in looking at total extinction. It used to be claimed that humans were the only animal which behaved in a structured world. Again, I don't believe this quite as strongly. Other animals seem to do it. But again, human thought may be different from other animals. So I'm going to give it to you. Say a third lecture. The big claim everyone always makes, which I think does have efficacy, is that at least in a strict definition, humans are the only animals which have language. There are limitations to that, and so forth. To some extent, with some definitions of language, I think this lesson is true. And humans are the great makers of culture. So I'm going to be comparing language and humans and non-human animals. I'm going to be comparing culture in human and non-human animals. Now, a lot of you, or most of you, are neuroscientists. The fourth lecture is going to be talking about the human brain and the non-human brain. I give the same but with this one. And I'm going to end up on that talking about genetics. What is the difference between human genetics compared to the genetics of other animals? Very interesting to think about flora in the nature, about the genetics of vocal imitators. You see songbirds and humans, now we show up as beautiful songbirds, but sometimes we kill each other. So it seems as though there's sort of a mosaic of evolution rather than a straightforward uh, ladder of nature going, going up from towards some kind of beautiful or exotic character and turning around to some kind of ugly creature. <coughs> um, I tend to be a scientist, so I'm interested in explanation. And I'm interested in causation. So having gone through the first four lectures, going gone through the various differences between humans and other animals, I'm going to talk about causation. What causes cultural cumulative cultural evolution and where do we get? And finally, in the last lecture, I'm going to try and spot some of those out. So instead of making lots of wider claims and using code phrases, I'm going to show how I hope I'm going to show, and largely how we can use modeling and various other techniques to actually show that some of this stuff is true, or at least to falsify it, show that it's false, and to put numbers on this, so that we no longer have purely qualitative arguments, we have quantitative arguments as well. So that's the way the course is going to be organized. There's going to be a little exam at the end. Uh, I'm sure that mention is on the chat. Uh, what do you think I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to ask you to write a letter, uh, uh, an essay. I've been told more than three pages is too much for you, but you are allowed to write more. So I want you to, when you listen to lectures, I want you to find one particular aspect where humans are different from other animals, or where someone has claimed that humans are different from other animals. It's possible you can use a controversial one. Um, I want you to say what the first one is. I want you to write one side of the argument. I want, I want you to summarize one side of the argument. I want you to summarize the opposite side of the argument to a scientist that's showing data, showing experiments. I want you to then give your own opinion about what this is. That will get you, if you can do all that confidently, that will get you very close to 99 marks. But there are bonus points. Um, if you contradict me, uh, you have to say something which I claim is not true, but which is wrong. If you contradict me, you get an extra mark. First one. Second, if you, s if you use material, ideas, arguments, tables, which are not in this course, and which are not in my bibliography, you get another bonus point. So that you, you get bonus points by showing I'm wrong and by developing your own idea with your own material. So you can get a very good mark for that. So innovation is good, even if it's wrong. So uh, before I start the real substance of this particular lecture, how many questions? Uh, I'm also going to distribute, I've set each lecture 
for Christ, but not for God alone. So at the end of this next part, I think the most interesting is maybe not how much an email how much an email is I'm not sure how well your IT works here. There are probably a few Dropbox links because things that some of the slides are very, very good. I don't think they'll get there with your email. So I'll leave it. But it should be online by tonight. Okay. So the theme for today is exceptionalism versus anti exceptionalism. Data versus data. So I'm going to start off by looking at the exceptionalist view. Now if you look at the if you look at Genesis, you will see that uh, the quote says, and God said, this is our English version, this is the same wherever you go. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and the cattle on all the earth, and every creeping thing, and everything that creepeth upon the earth. So the idea here is that humans, and only humans, are made in the image of God. Humans have a soul. Humans are very special, and we get this, we get this 2,000 years I'd like to fast forward to that next 4,000 years. And we get to the end of the 17th century, and we get Descartes. Descartes was, in many ways, one of the first modern scientists. I think we also have not to admit something here. Really. Descartes, uh, the American botanic, was very good here. Uh, Descartes saw animals and humans and the world as a vast machine. So at the time, So his analysis, today we talk about the mind and maybe it's being merged with the computer, he talks about the mind being like a clock. But he had these very, very mechanical explanations. But at the same time, he was a Catholic and he was a real believer. And so he said, oh, oh dear, how do, how do we put these two, you know, the world is just one big clock, how do I put that, those two ideas so, he became a dualist. By dualist, I mean someone who is not just one world, but the world can be split into two different worlds. He talks about a raised extension that cannot be filled. This is the material of which the universe is made. And he says the mechanism which drives the universe and which drives animal mind and which drives a lot of the human mind is clockwork. Clockwork explains uh, a raised extension. But he says the whole of the universe is not a raised extension. We also have a raised cogitant thinking material. And humans have the thinking material. And if we don't realize the difference between having thinking material and not having thinking material, then you are making a horrible mistake, he says. And there us go. There's none so powerful in me with feeble mind. Now, mind uh, can be straight past the virtue and the superposition, but the soul of brute, meaning animal, is of the same nature far away. Humans are fundamentally different. And if you're not a human, from Descartes' point of view, this is the worst. All really are just robots, automata, he calls them. And that, he, that implies that all the humans, don't, the other species, the other species, there are too many humans, and only humans are conscious. This is an extremely radical position. Now I actually, have, I, I'm not naive at times, I sometimes think that no sensible person could possibly believe that anyone who owns a dog knows that that dog is conscious, or at least that's what I think. But uh, anyone who has a cat thinks the same thing. Anyone who's seen a monkey thinks the same thing. But actually, I, I was in a meeting in Paris not very long ago, and I was to 
of an extremely eminent professor of neuroscientist who will remain without a name. Uh, and I said to her, well, it's obvious my job's a pity. But of course it isn't obvious. Uh, where's the consciousness of God? Well, if they don't write poetry, then it isn't. So actually, this idea of Descartes, at least in part, but I suspect in many other parts of the world, is absolutely alive and kicking. But actually, we find this idea in biology as well. But there's no exception. No one knows who wrote the majority. Moses is a very great man. He wrote on evolution and biology. He wrote at the same time as Darwin. And he developed all his theories. He developed the theory of natural selection. And he knew about Darwin's work. They were in correspondence with each other. And and um, Morrison said, well, what are we going to do about this? We're working on the same theory. What should we do? And Darwin, very graciously, at, when he published the, the, the um, Origin of Species, acknowledges that his ideas were developed with Wallace. But Wallace said, I, I, quote, I quote here, that a brain is slightly larger than that of a gorilla would have just been enough for the limited development of savages. Now, this was written in the 19th century, and most everyone I've had with him including the French, were basically savages. Um, so that, for that, it's enough to have a brain like a gorilla. Naturally, natural selection could only have endowed savage man with a brain a few degrees superior to that of an ape, whereas he actually possesses one a little inferior to that of a gorilla. So, Wallace is still on the He believes that even the most primitive of human beings has a mind which is totally different from that of an ape. And that although he's developed the theory of natural selection, that can't explain why we have such a brain. It's not enough, according to Wallace. Who knows who is Ramon Cazal, the neuroscientist? Please. He's the one who made the criticism, the very good criticism. And he too said the same sort of thing. You can see the quote over there, I won't read it, but he said, you know. If I think properly, and we do it ourselves, we look very similar. And it's only saying when they look really similar. But we, even if we have something structurally in common, there must be something qualitatively different between my brain, which can do the fundamental science, and the brain of chimpanzees and the stuff. He just wasn't prepared to admit that there could be some sort of evolutionary continuity between us. Now, if you go to the cognitive neuroscience, apart from that collection of ideology which is recovered from the basic biology, you'll find that this belief is extremely common. They're not yours, like, like Descartes, like no cognitive science, scientist today, no scientist today, believes that there is a, a what you say, and an a later percent of that idea is totally gone. Yet they have taken on Descartes' idea that the brain is mechanism. Understand the brain by looking at the mechanism of the things that work. We're going to walk in. Uh, I do the same thing for the same over there. But what they've taken from Descartes is what there are some special features which are just qualitatively different in human beings from other animals. And if you look at different scientists, you get different beliefs. I, I quoted a few of them here Gentner, Kramer, uh, Penn. There's a huge list. Of Sometimes they sometimes they are they overlap. You know, humans use language. Humans have a theory of mind. That means that I can work out what you're thinking about me and what you think I am thinking about you. All these sort of things. Uh, humans can perceive. Humans use tools. Humans can use transposition influence. So if I know that I am more powerful than you, and I also know that you are more powerful than the other guy. Then I can work out that I'm more powerful than the other guy, and I don't have to actually observe that. So I can work out whether it's a good thing for me to have a fight or not to have a fight. Um, I can make abstract categories. Uh, I can look at relational categories, so I can sort of say, well, this is a failure set, or this is a distant set, or this is tired set, or yawn set. And all these people have done experiments that work, and they are all going to try and show that these abilities that we're talking about are genuinely present in humans, 
Time's up. Okay. What about the others? Um, <laughs> there's so many of these. There's no way that these are six lectures I can go through all of them. In fact, I want to go through them in about two lectures in a different course. But so I'm going to just select a few. But the arguments from the experiments and telegrams they use are very similar, regardless of which set you see. So I'm going to talk about the ability of animals to engage in abstract thought, in particular, the ability to make chain difference distinctions. If this stimulus A is same as stimulus B, they look different. I'm going to talk about the ability to form categories. So you can try to tell uh, art by Picasso category one from art by Manet category two. Presumably they are Manet. I'm going to talk about quantitative inference, which is the thing about looking at how powerful people are to know their theories. I'm going to talk about analogical thinking. I've just made an analogy between Darwinian natural selection and cultural selection, cultural evolution. I think that's an analogy. Can we even claim that only humans can make analogies other animals don't? Uh, I'm going to talk about planning, or what one person called Siebendorf has called mental time travel. Uh, in other words, uh, I plan, I seriously plan to be here tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. And I plan to take a plane back to Switzerland on the 30th of December. Um, it is claimed that only humans make plans animals. Again, there are experiments for this. Um, we're going to look both at what these claims are. We're going to look at experiments showing these claims may be true. We're going to look at observations showing they may be false. And I'm also going to look at methodological points in common. So the methodologies used by the exceptionalists have a lot in common. Uh, they like animals and people. Um, the, the methodologies used by the anti-exceptionalists also have a lot in common. They like animals, human food, or food. Uh, but it's not that simple. We can make it more complicated. And we'll be looking at their methodologies. But before I do that, I want to also look at the anti-exceptionalists position. So I'm not going to get onto experiments today. We're going to talk about that next week. But uh, I'm going to talk about people who don't agree on this sharp qualitative divide between humans and other animals. Now, if you go to very primitive France in English, if you go to strong cultures in Africa, you will find animism. That is, it is believed that not only do I have a soul, but so do other animals, for example, the the jaguar has a soul, but not only animals have their soul as well. Also, mountains also rivers. So it's fairly <coughs> obvious from that that the world is made up of interactions between bodies with souls. But there's not even a fundamental distinction between animate objects and inanimate objects. Still less a distinction between humans and other animals. I mean, this is if you think it's a fairly it's a fairly natural belief if you are a very small animal living in a big forest where you tend to get eaten and bad things tend to happen to you very often which you can't control. It's fairly obvious. I'm just one fourth among many. I'm probably not the most natural. But this is a natural animist belief and which you get in large parts of the world even today. We go forward a bit in time uh, and we get beliefs in the transmigration of souls. If you're a Hindu, you can believe that you might kill your gods as a monkey. And because I was a well-behaved monkey, in the next generation, my soul is reborn as a human. And I can believe that if I behave well as a human, my soul can be reborn both on a higher level, or if I behave badly, on a lower level. So again, if my soul can be transformed from one sort of animal into another, just like that, because of my behavior, well, then this again is a sign that there's no fundamental distinction between a human soul and a non-human soul. Uh, this, isn't, this, this wasn't a belief exclusive to Indian culture 
Pythagoras, who came from the theorem and uh, believing in the two prime numbers, also believed in the transcendental soul. So this is part of the Greek culture, Greek Western Hellenism. So you have this. If you read, if you read the Ramayana, one of the great um, Indian stories, you will find that the hero who is Rama, who according to some were gods and according to others was just a great human hero, but his great ally in the Ramayana is Hanuman, who is the god of monkeys. And the god of monkeys talks just like a human, thinks like a, just like a human. The only thing is I think he has some problems with prefrontal cortex because his, his executive control is not good. He, he loses his temper easily, he's reckless, he's, ab he's a bit too adventurous. He's not quite, he's inferior to, to Rama, but only just. And sometimes when they have arguments, he's right and Rama is wrong. So again, in Indian mythology, in Indian mythology, there is no, think about a big country. There's no dispute. One of the distinctions between the human race and the, at least the monkey story. But if we come to Plato and Aristotle again, at the beginnings of our Western culture, you find they believe that all animals are souls. They might have different qualities, they could believe different things, but the idea that they don't have a soul at all is completely extraneous to their culture. They look, they'll always want to have really good souls if they're animals, but which is what all academics believe to go true. It's basically the same thing. Uh, but yes, we will concede that everyone has a soul. So in this we actually get the Quran is, is slightly ambiguous on this, but there is a surah in which, they, in which the Quran says that all animals and men will come together, they'll all belong to the Quran, and they will all come together and they will all be called to heaven together. So even in one of the Abrahamic religions, this idea of this clear distinction between humans and animals is not always there. And in fact, in the greatest of all Catholic Roman Catholic philosophers, he too didn't make this distinction. This is Thomas Aquinas, and even much of the towards the modern world. He said that man's superiority to beast and shrewdness in memory, not as a result from anything in our sympathies and our, and our perception or admiration, but because all of them have an affinity and closeness to intelligence which flows into them. These powers and passions are not so very different those in animals, though they are sentient. So even a great Catholic philosopher can believe that there is no clean, qualitative distinction between humans and other animals. So let's move forward a bit further in time. Carlyle. Carlyle is a fundamental part. He's a geologist who has a fundamental Charles Darwin's ideas. When Charles Lyell discovered deep time, he looked at the geology, he looked in particular at the Amazing Grand Canyon, and he said that geology <coughs> is the result of laws which are in operation today, like erosion, operating on the ground over really long periods of time, over millions or thousands of millions of years. No one has ever said this before. If you looked at studies before Lyell, people thought the world was formed uh, 6,000 years ago. Charles Lyell said, no, it was formed hundreds of, hundreds of millions of years ago, maybe thousands of millions of years ago, and that the law which shaped the earth was exactly the same law which are in operation today. So we can study what is happening in current day uh, geology, like current day fluid, uh, current erosion, and we can project it back to into deep time. Now, Charles Darwin read this, and, and on this basis, Charles Darwin, Darwin had passionate ideas about evolution. So instead of saying that the mountains and the rivers, the valleys, are the result of laws operating today, operating over 
bi biological organism today are the result of laws which we can observe today whose basis we observe uh, artificial selection in chickens we can observe an artificial selection today those same laws describe how man has evolved on earth and this is just like Charles Charles uh, Lyon that there are different laws. Humans are governed by different laws. Charles Lyell and Darwin say, no, the evolution of human species is exactly the same laws which have always applied since the formation of the Earth, and this is enough to explain what we are. Now, Charles Darwin's first important book was The Origin of Species. He went on to write a second important book called the origin of man. Now, if you look at the origin of species, it doesn't say anything specific about human beings at all. It's just a general theoretical thesis, and a lot of it is about worms and pigeons and domestic animals. The center man is about us. And he shows that the key is, if you're an evolving human, I must say something to make you really, really interested. It's sex and sexual. But he shows that our anatomies have lots in common with the anatomy of monkeys and apes. He shows that we have lots of perceptual similarities. Even today, a visual scientist will tell you the differences between monkey vision and our vision are very small indeed. He shows that we have similar, similar tastes. Things such as sweet are very, very pleasant to human beings. They're very pleasant to monkeys as well. He suggests very strongly that we and other animals are all that we can all feel pain. In fact, we can feel pain so well that the, the symptoms of pain in a monkey or even a dog are extremely sensitive to me. The same is true. If you find it very interesting to stand on an animal of fur, you have no difficulty in understanding this whatsoever. And he argues that higher reasons, for instance, human self-awareness, evolved. Conclusion is that the difference in man between the difference in mind between man and the higher animals greatest of the great as it is certainly is one of degree and not of kind. So now we see the key to this thing the perception of pain that is a key quality of divide between human and non-human, which can't be done. And Darwin says, no, these are just, basically, it's just like a number. Maybe it isn't higher. Maybe it isn't better. But it's not fundamentally different. So, uh, we come to modern science. And you'll find striking differences between humans and other animals. On the one hand, you can look at the lab. And the guy who's the dean of this two lectures, um, his experiments on fleas. A chimpanzee, but we all know that chimpanzees are clever, but also by probes. Remember, he's showing you videos of experiments which are really very hard for lay people to imagine that the probes could do things which are quite simple. We're going to talk about pasteurization, and then it shows in some ways pigeons do just as well as human chimpanzees, but that may be for circumstances. Uh, I've even mentioned briefly what else pigeons can do, and they may have done this too. I'm going to be looking at language, language, language production, and language understanding, and you probably are aware because it's been very visible on the popular press seen a whole series of experiments uh, teach, trying to teach language to non-human animals. Primarily, primarily um, apes, but also parrots. There's a, a very famous parrot called Alex, which was a, he 
we were going to see next from Lake City Lecture. It's playing very good. And Dalton, we're going to talk about theory of mind. Now, all this is stuff that we're doing now. The stuff you're discussing is this. The stuff you're information is really here. The lab stuff you can do, you get to sit down with monkeys for three years, to give you access to the animals, you set up an experiment, and uh, for a year or two years it's done. It's a normal experiment for normal scientists. And basically everything we knew until about, well, until 1960 was pretty common. And even now, it's a huge bulk of what we know comes from experiments. But simultaneously, very few people who work in the wild, I have a friend, a friend, a colleague, called Christopher Bob, who comes from the Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology uh, in Leipzig, he works with chimpanzees in the Bombay Forest. If you want to do a PhD with him, you have to go and live in the forest for five years and end up with doing your PhD because he studies chimpanzees and he said that chimpanzees have got meat teeth, but they won't let you eat real teeth. So he stayed in the forest doing basically nothing for a very long time until the local chimpanzee community had got meat teeth. Then you would do your PhD. And it takes a lot of insects, it takes tenacity, it takes porridge. You have to know, learn each chimpanzee by name. You have to be able to recognize like a hundred different chimpanzees. And you take drawing observations. Uh, so chimpanzee number one scratch chimpanzee number two and remove mice. And chimpanzee number two made it with chimpanzee number three, who was a dire enemy of chimpanzee number four. And you keep all this in note pad and your professor thanks you, then he, not you, publishes a very good book about it. And he, not you, becomes famous. So that's the life of a PhD student. Um, but these wild studies, we had to find, are incredibly informative. And a lot of things which we don't see in the lab can actually become clear in the wild. And the wild has actually produced us some data which is really important and very, very useful, which we're going to be seeing in the next few lectures. Now, with all this, we have this huge volume of data from lab studies and from wild studies, and we're going to discover that it's wildly contradictory. Every time someone says a chimpanzee can do something, the mouse says it can't. And, of course, we have our own human biases, because, um, because uh, we have people, we, we believe we have some intuitive insight into what it means to be human. What we're going to try and do in these lectures is take what one philosopher called Nagel, Thomas Nagel, called the Duke of Nagel. Suppose I was a mouse, and I, I would do a mission to Earth to discover, look at the, look at the moon. What could that mouse do? What is its intuition? So I have to get away. The mouse can have no, no intuition about what it means to be human, because the mouse can't know it's human. So he's just looking for objectivity. And I, <coughs> and the Martian wants to distinguish what are the differences between human and another animal, and wants to explain human science, and human science. So she wants to understand why those differences are rare. So before we go any further, we have to decide, we have to see what difference, we have to imagine what differences the Martian could actually see, which would give us a normal explanation. And I'm going to suggest that there are some of those differences, so give me a list. So what are they? I think the first thing we have to see is that humans are split so far without splitting up into different species. So what we hear see here is Homo erectus. Homo erectus is one of our direct ancestors, lived about two million years ago, from between about two million years ago till about half a million years ago. Looks very similar to a human, has a brain similar to ours, a bit smaller. It's about a thousand species on average, ours is about fourteen hundred species on average, but very similar. And interestingly, if you see from this map, you get Homo erectus all over the old world. There is no other large mammal you can find this way. You get radiation, you find cats all over the, the, the world, felines, but they keep it. When, they, when, a, when, when cats went really, really, when different cats, when 
know that Siberia is a convicted sex again. Humans have gone all over the world without system. So even today, uh, a human can, can ask an Aboriginal from Australia a native Aboriginal from anywhere else in the world, and do so by lots of offspring. That the kid from the Aboriginal in Australia, by bringing up in New York, this is in New York, and the kid from New York, by bringing him up in a tribe in the depths of Africa, he's going to become a member of the tribe in the depths of Africa. And so this this cognitive system of humans, the genetic decision among human races, are absolutely complex. So we spread and we don't. Because there are manuscripts studies about a serpent that can pass the scent of a dog. Uh, a few weeks ago, they studied a chicken. So we can actually trace where they came from, and they do match human migration patterns. Extremely well. And human migration so patterns. So human, human uh, patterns match those of the same. And, and I'm saying. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm but, but no, that, that's, I'm not really thinking that. I'm just saying that you can we, can, yeah, we, okay. can, we can really claim that. So this is a, a real fact. And the second fact is it's being presented to pressure and pressure is on. So this map, which is calculated from genetic data, uh, shows how humans are believed to have migrated over just over the last 70,000 years, <coughs> which is just a blink in time. So the first anatomically modern human we get in East Africa certainly conceivably covered about between 180,000 and 300,000 years ago. About 100,000 years ago, they emigrate back into the Middle East. It doesn't really last. They withdraw. There's a whole series of advances and, and withdrawal. But about 70,000 years ago, they go there and they stay. And then we get an eastern uh, migration which goes by, along the coast via India, comes to China, crosses the sea, comes down into the Philippines, into uh, Indonesia, ends up in Australia. And we get a Western, a Western movement across North Africa, into Europe, and so on, and so on. So this is a really neat approach. So my first point is, is how, how much we spread. The second is how quickly it can spread. The third point is how much so most animals, if you see two chimpanzees on different sides of Africa, um, an ecologist will study a, a, a physical animal behavior, can see differences in their behavior. I will not see them, and neither will you. They're very small. If I take two human cubs, like, for instance, a baby in New York playing with its iPhone, and Sam, the hunter-gatherer, in the Kalahari Desert, the difference in their culture Because I can tell you it's a genetic, there's, there's bigger genetic diversity in some other animals as well. But yes?
My master, who has more knowledge, if he sees the uh, Kalahari Desert people and he sees us, it's going to take him no time. He'll probably think it's a different people. It's going to take no time at all to see it. If he sees the Kalahari Desert people and he sees me, what do you mean we are? It does not take a fine distinction to see that those are really different. I don't think we need to react to that. I don't think we even need scientific proof. We just sort of look at dwelling places, clothing, weapons, uh, what they eat. And it's a really gross difference. There is two approaches. I mean, you, as you mentioned, the, the music tool is very, I mean, we've evolved in the last 50, 60 years here. Yeah. So we use a lot of more tools, and chimpanzees do not. So yeah. we see very big differences because they're, they're really scared. They have a lot to say. True. When they get in zoos, they do make them. They come from different subpopulations. So we get make them in both cases. But they're both chimpanzees. What I'm saying is that the chimpanzees, uh, you really can't make with the gorilla or with another ape that's in front of, or with another. They, they really separate them. That, that's just an introduction of isolation. So we have this so called. We have this vast uh, cultural differentiation. Even if you go to the, the um, hunter-gatherer societies, or you go to the Inuit, or you go to the Kalahari Desert, you'll find they have a very large number of qualitative uh, descriptions of food. The man called Ogba, <coughs> who a very nice anthropologist from the 70s, writes it as a count of them. So how many foods, and it's just it's the ecology of food, the food, food gathering of food. He counted how many different ones there were, and he had formal distinctions for when they came to be different or not different. And he counted how complicated they were. So he said, how many building blocks do I need before it took me a week to make this food? And he showed that in virtually all human societies, and later on we're going to see this with one or two exceptions, in most human societies, the number of food and the complexity of the food is sort of incommensurable compared to non-human animals. But non-human animals, it's not here. have this very vast world. Uh, so the question is, what's allowed or what's behind? Now some neurobiologists say these are not truly people. They say people are wrong. Uh, they all say it's all to do with our brains. You can look at skulls and you can measure the cranial capacity. You can make a, you can make a cast of the skull and you can measure how many feet deep and you can count. And you can see that the size of our brain evolved very slowly over the first sort of five million years. It separated it from chimpanzees and then began to grow very fast indeed until we get to our current size. But the size of the esophagus is still fast. I would ask Dr. Mack explain what, what, what made that happen. So why did that evolve just in the last seven million years out of uh, 200 million years of
fact, the famous Catherine Mendel was such a remarkable figure in our own. And Mary Powell may have been cleverer than you think, but you don't really need to know the person to tell you that she was the best. So, Greg Sidney Frank, author of the book. Some people have suggested that by use of language, and many of you may have read Stephen Pinker, who is on my left hand. Um, he likes that book, and he has said that he likes that book. He says it's, we, we, for some reason, we make the use of language. So by language, we mean we see tens of thousands of different things that refer to different objects in the world. You know, we can see sometimes we see hundreds, we have a lot of difficulty to see tens of thousands. <coughs> but we have this use of syntax. We can, humans can produce almost So that's going to be my theme for the next lesson. So in the next lesson, uh, we'll be talking about Cornwall the Toolmaker, which is a legend of two halves. Uh, I'll spend the afternoon how special the average of the tools make tools. What's the difference between the tools we make and the tools other animals make? And I'm going to be posing the question, why do these other animals develop the ability to make tools like themselves? And then I'm going to be talking about Homo the Thinker, how special are human capabilities to abstract thought, how special are human capabilities for planning, how special is the human ability to understand others. So that's going to be what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. At the end of each lecture, I have six or six or others. Uh, of course, you must read all of this and come back and report tomorrow. No, I don't mean that. Uh, if any of you, none of this is you can go through all these courses and read nothing, but I don't recommend it. I've tri tried to see last year to come off the sentences, and which I'm proud of. I think it should inspire me when I read them. And each, what you find in the bibliography is always the bibliography for the lecture I've just given. So if one of you chooses a theme I've mentioned in today's lecture, or at other times, this is the first part for the bibliography. There's also going to be a longer bibliography on the website that I'll distribute to you by email. Again, to be clever, read three good things from the bibliography, keep the facts, you don't try and read everything in class. Should be selective. I just, I just want it to be the biggest repertoire possible for your collection. So I rest with an hour and a half from thinking and talking about this book. Well done, that. So, questions, suggestions, I've been getting some from over there. Good. And one question, one thing, uh, said, always with this question, who do you know? I said I wanted a, a who do you know that looked a bit like the Martian. So I think the objection there, I'm not sure it was right in this specific, but the spirit of the objection is correct. And we always have to listen to it. Make sure we're not biased by our human knowledge. Because animals will do things. They don't necessarily have to do them in our own way. And maybe we're better at recognizing them when they do them our way than when they do them their own way. the environment is something that the human uses to create. So I say, but different users can create different sorts of environments. So my, my son Hudson does not have the same sort of environment I do. But I'm suggesting that the social environment in general, yes, they could create and use. So in the uh, university we're talking about this more specifically later on. But I think humans, I think humans in general learn much more from their parents and from, and from each other than other animals. It is a natural part of their ecological need. And 
therefore, if you have taken to the Philippines, which facilitated that, you have a second to that in mind. Therefore, the dream that will give you those second to abilities will come to fruition. And the folks who have received it too, like Kim Jong Un. So you all sitting here are not seemingly not going to go on to something. This is a cultural thing. This is part of our academic culture. We're teaching the world that we should work hard and do this. This is listening to professors talk and trying to learn from them. And this actually helps to meet the certain ideas that we need to use. It's not really, I don't think we have a dream from which Kim Jong Un is protected. But we do have this cultural habit, which is very useful now in our present time of crisis. Mm -hmm. So just let each one finish and then I'll go to the next one. Yeah, yeah. If you're talking about hundreds of thousands, then we need more than two per year. But I think, I think it's only for a few of you, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, we, I think humans have special developed cultures, but I also know that some do have cultures by that definition. So, like, for instance, uh, the, the chimpanzees <coughs> played by God use strong food. They, and they have an anvil, um, and they put the anvil on the floor, and they crush nuts with a hammer stone against the anvil. This is taught by chimpanzee mothers. really teaches them to deal with the issues. So that to me is a cultural skill. We're different to you because we are more advanced. And it's more important for our intelligence. Our chimpanzees could probably get on reasonably well even without our cultural acquired skills. We can't. If we if we if we lose our cultural acquired skills we're done. You know, I, I can't think of what to work. So for us culture is fundamental to our intelligence. For chimpanzees I think we're more capable of Symbolic culture is everything that is central to their other members. And material culture is everything that is central to other material things. If I, if I hold the seal and plant olive seeds there, that is material culture and it's inherited by my kids. Um, if I have a social norm that I will not do certain things to certain people under certain circumstances, or that I will do other things, that also is inherited. So I think the oldest not genetically transmitted. So if I just have an instinct that I will do it anyhow, that is not cultural. The fact that I have blonde hair is not cultural. That's Jewish. But the fact that I'm talking through windows is cultural. Yes? Well, I mean, I need to think that you can apply this to your real world and not other societies that you can live in. Yeah, yeah. I need to work on that too. Because society is what it is. You're married. maybe less than a week, we're talking about two terms of paper. And, and none of it is really conspicuous to anybody else in the same place. So I think it exists, but it's rare, and I don't think it's very important. Other questions? Yes? Is this the same in the culture of high culture, or do you 
Yeah. 